Now that we've established a good understanding of just how complex learning as a behavior in the animal world really is, we're going to now look at more of a natural selection evolutionary component of behavior by understanding the next topic. We're going to call this next flowchart and topic the following, and we'll look at what this really means as we look through some examples. Entitle the next flowchart, Selection for Individual Selection for Individual Survival Selection for Individual Survival and Reproductive Success and Reproductive Success Two of the most important things to possibly, the most important things that every living organism wants to do. Survive and have reproductive success, and those that survive and have reproductive success will be selected by natural selection to evolve, to continue, and to continue uh, creating an ancestry, continue to create uh, offspring. So what we can see are two major ways that we have selection. One of those ways is based off of a very common animal behavior known as foraging. Foraging is a classic animal behavior that is highly selected upon for those who are most successful in their survival and then their reproductive success. Foraging is simply the same idea as feeding behaviors. There's really no difference between these two ideas. When you are foraging, you are feeding yourself through a specific mechanism of behaviors. This could include things like locating. And this could include things like selecting the food, locating the food. This could also include things like gathering and hunting, all of which are mechanisms to forage, all of which are mechanisms to feed yourself, all of which are actions, and actions are thus behaviors as we established very early on. So when we're locating, selecting, gathering, or hunting things, we are usually hunting, locating, selecting, and gathering food for foraging purposes. Um, an idea that needs to be understood about foraging is something called the optimal foraging theory. A very, very nice way of understanding foraging and its relationship to natural selection and evolution as a whole. When we think of optimal foraging, what we're trying to do is the following. We're trying to predict how many animals are going to forage, because foraging itself is not necessarily the greatest thing in the world. And I'll see, you'll see what I mean in just a second. Predict how many animals, how many animals are going to forage. And what we mean by this is, how many animals are going to go out of their way, go out of their comfort zone to locate, select, gather, and hunt for food when we know that this type of action comes with certain costs and some benefits as well. And we utilize the optimal foraging theory to answer these types of questions and to make that type of prediction. And we realize that animals will do the following. They tend to try their best to spend the minimum, M-I-N for minimum, and I'll make sure that's emphasized, spend the minimum amount of energy, amount of energy, capital E for energy, in order to get, so we have to have a trade-off for this energy that we spend in order to get, of course, a max. You want to get a max amount of payback, so a max return on, onto your investment. And that payback in this optimal foraging theory is, of course, going to be what? That's probably going to be, since we're talking about foraging, which is feeding, this is going to be nutrition from food. That's what we want. We want the max amount of nutrition from food with the minimum amount of energy invested in order to get such food. Then we will be optimally foraging. And the theory states that this is what animals do. They optimally forage. And if they optimally forage, those who optimally forage the best will have not only the max payback, but thus they will have the max reproductive success simply because they will be the most successful in their survival. And if you're the most successful in your survival, chances are you will be the most successful and maximize your reproductive success. So a very simple theory with a very nice evolutionary component and adaptive component to it. Finally, in foraging, we have to understand that there are trade-offs. 
sort of what I've mentioned, the costs and benefits of foraging. And the trade-offs are simply the idea of spending the least to get the most. This is the same thing seen in every single foraging behavior in the animal world. Spending the least to get the most. So you want to minimize energy and maximize output and payback in nutrition. So you're always going to, as an animal, analyze uh, your costs slash benefits and specifically in relation to getting food, aka of foraging. What are the costs of leaving your nice home environment? What are the benefits of leaving your nice home environment in terms of getting food? And animals will do this. And these costs and benefits will sort of uh, exemplify themselves in a couple of different scenarios, such as the amount of energy that you get from the specific food that you forage for. If there's a lot of energy, then of course your benefit is pretty high. Um, but you also have to think of the difficulty in getting such food. Difficulty to get. That's a cost, of course, that you have to worry about as an animal. You have to worry about the ability to travel. Do you have the ability to travel? That's another cost. And you also maybe have to worry about things like predation risk. All of things that an animal almost innately has to figure out whether or not it's worth doing. Is the trade-off worth it? Am I going to optimally forage? Am I going to get the most nutrition from my food and then subsequently get the most reproductive success? So this is a selective mechanism. Selection will act on those who forage the best, who optimize forage the best and understand trade-offs the best. These animals will succeed the most. In addition to foraging, there's another type of behavior that's very, very selected upon, and that's mating behavior and mate choice. So we'll do that one over here. Mating behavior and mate choice. So selection will act upon both of these things in the sense that mating behavior and mate choice, of course, are a huge, huge part of reproductive success. So I'll just write reproductive success as RS because mating is essence reproduction and mate choice is also a part of reproductive success. Mating behavior is all about the following. It's all about the idea of seeking, attracting, and choosing a mate. Seeking, attracting, and then hopefully also choosing a mate after such behaviors have occurred. And when doing this, what one hopes for is that they're going to be able to beat out the competition that is also present for the seeking, the attracting, and choosing of a mate because there will be competition. Thus, there will be energy necessary to beat this competition in order to achieve success in terms of reproduction. And also, there's going to be another major sort of thing that you want to look for is parental care. Will you gain parental care out of your mating behavior and your mate choice? Is the competition worth it? And if it is worth it, is the parental care enough so that you know that what you have invested in terms of energy will be paid off in your offspring? The best way to understand the idea of mating behavior is to simply look at mating systems. So we'll do that one down here. If we look at some mating systems seen in nature, you will see that certain mating behaviors and certain mate choices are all based off of the systems present in that animal species. For one, mating systems may involve promiscuous species. So we'll call this promiscuous species. These are species and animals that do not provide or do not need any strong pair bond in the sense that male and female will not stay together. So there's no strong pair bond between male and female. Um, thus, we call these species promiscuous. In addition, these promiscu promiscuous species might be contrasted with things that follow a monogamous mating system. And a monogamous mating system, mono, um, relating to one, is all about the idea of one male plus one female being exclusive to each other. But what we have to remember is that this exclusivity is only for a certain duration. 
Uh, what we mean by this is usually in nature we see this not for an entire lifetime, but really only for, let's say, one mating season. One male and one female will be monogamous for that specific duration. There are lifetime pair bonds as well in the animal world, but this is why we mention for a duration. It's usually not for the lifetime. Sometimes it is, but it all depends on the species and animal in question. And lastly, in terms of mating systems, we also have to look at um, polygamous mating systems. These are quite common in nature, the most common mating systems. These mating systems are going to involve one mate, and that one mate, uh, one person is going, one individual will mate with many of the opposite sex. Opposite, with many of opposite sex. So one with many of the opposite sex, poly meaning many, and so we have these types of mating systems. This can be subdivided into things that follow a polygony. Let me rewrite that. This is polygony. Also P-O-L-Y-G-Y-N-Y -Y for polygony, and there's also the idea of polyandry, both of which are specific to either male and female. Polygony is all about one male with many females, and polyandry is one female with many males. I don't have much room to write that down here, so you can put that here. This is one, one male with many females, and this is one female with many males, both of which follow polygamous mating systems. And finally, the last idea we want to understand about mating behavior and mate choice in terms of selection is to see um, this idea of what we call sexual dimorphism. So this is all about the idea that there is going to be a dimorph. Di meaning two, morph meaning shape. Two different shapes dependent on sex of the individual in question. We can state that sexual dimorph dimorphism is simply the idea of male and female uh, differing in their appearance. So we'll say differ in appearance. That's what dimorphism is essentially going to be looking at. But this differing in appearance is directly related to the mating system in question. And that's because when we see a monogamous mating system, what we notice in terms of sexual dimorphism is that there's actually a lack of sexual dimorphism. Individuals, male and females, don't differ in monogamous relationships. They actually look relatively alike. And in polygamous systems, this is when we have, um, and this is going to answer why these look alike, and in polygamous, they don't look alike. We do see a huge amount of sexual dimorphism in polygamous mating systems, because in this mating system, one individual, one member of the sex, has to attract multiple mates. One member attracts multiple mates. And so in this situation, you have to make sure that that one member, which is usually the male in most uh, natural mating systems, is a bit showy, we would say, in quotes. This is the idea of if you understand a male versus a female peacock. A male peacock has this huge, expansive, what seems like unnecessary, um, huge amount of coloration and plumage, whereas the female peacock has none of it whatsoever. Those two completely differ in their appearance. Why is that? Well, that's because they practice a polygamous mating system in which one male, the male with the best plumage, the most colorful, the most expansive, will have multiple and most of the mates and thus has to be showy in its sexual dimorphism. Whereas in a monogamous relationship, those two individuals look alike because there's no need to be showy. There's no need to be the most attractive, let's say, in a monogamous relationship. Thus, both will look relatively alike. Overall, we have to understand that selection is going to act on successful foragers and successful behaviors in terms of mating and mate choice.